continue our study of Exodus, we are in Exodus the 19th chapter and we are on verse 10. The Israelites are at the base of Mount Sinai and Moses is about to go up into the mountain. And already there has been a thick cloud or there's going to come. He, God has said he's going to come in a thick cloud, verse 9, so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. What God is going to do is he is going to establish that Moses is the only authorized leader of the people of Israel. They have to believe in him. Implied here is that not all of the people believed in Moses. And we've already seen that evident because of the mumbling, the grumbling that's already taken place among the Israelites against Moses. And God says it's not against you, it's against me. It, they're grumbling against my leadership. It's not, not you. Uh, Moses has a hard time, though, seeing that. Uh, but now God is going to give a visual representation to the people about his sovereignty and the fact that he is in control. So verse 10, we begin. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Notice that he says the people must wash their clothes. They've got to wash their clothes. This is not because their clothes are necessarily dirty, and I'm sure they were. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to get it fixed in the minds of the Israelites that when a holy God appears, they are to be holy themselves. They've got to get that fixed. And it's going to take some time getting that fixed in the mind of the Israelites. Remember, they've been in Egyptian captivity, they and their ancestors, for well over 400 years. And now they've been liberated and they've got to change their mentality and their mindset about religion from accommodating to paganism and accommodating to the Egyptian pantheon of gods and goddesses to the fact that there is one God, only one God. He is over all. And by the way, he is, he is ultimate holiness and he demands that his people be holy. We're going to see that theme repeated, especially in Leviticus. But here, God is beginning to roll that out before the people. So verse 12, he says, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Now, Randall Bailey is supposed to be coming here in about two weeks on Wednesday night to speak on the subject of holiness. And he has done extensive study over many years on that subject. He has some interesting thoughts concerning it. One of those thoughts, and I don't want to steal his thunder, one of those thoughts is that the holiness of God is dangerous. Have you ever thought of it in those terms? The holiness of God is dangerous. And here we see that graphically manifested. If you violate these boundaries that Moses is to place around the mountain, if you violate that boundary and touch God's holiness, you will die. And we're going to see that repeated throughout the, law, throughout the old law. Verse 13, No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Notice this. He's either going to be stoned to death or shot through. Literally, the Hebrew text says, shot through with arrows. With arrows. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. 
So the people of Israel were to be ritually fit. In other words, when we talk about ritually, we're talking about the fact that they have to wash their clothes and go through a ritual. Worship is what we're talking about. They have to be ritually fit in order to interact with this holy God who is coming down to be with them. Verse 15, he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. In other words, for the men, the husbands particularly, do not have any kind of sexual contact with women. Again, this is emphasizing to the people, when you come before a holy God, you are to be pure yourself. Not saying that marital relations are wrong, don't, get, don't misunderstand. It's just this idea of ritually clean, ritually pure. Nothing is to defile the person. Trying to fix it within their heads that sin defiles. That's the entire point. They have to get it fixed within their uh, minds and within their psyche that sin defiles the person. They haven't had this before. They haven't had this emphasis before. We today in the 21st century with the hindsight of the word of God, the complete revealed word of God, we take that for granted, don't we? We say, well, everybody knows that sin defiles. Everybody. No, the Israelites didn't. They sure didn't know that at this point. They had to be taught this by Moses, God through Moses particularly. They had to be shown this over and over and over, and even then it didn't sink in. It did not sink in. We don't really, can't, we can't really perceive in our minds how depraved and how wicked and how far gone the world was in Moses' day. We take it for granted, yes, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all these great men that we've already read about, all of these great individuals that served God, we think that they were the ones that were the dominant force. Oh, no, they weren't. The vast majority of the world's population did not have any knowledge of God. They did not have any knowledge of morality. And they did not have any knowledge of righteousness. And so God was breaking out, as it were, into the world through the Israelites, demonstrating his purity, demonstrating his holiness. And all of this, by the way, was leading eventually to the ultimate manifestation of God's righteousness in Jesus Christ. This scheme of redemption that God set in motion all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, this thing has been rolling out, and it's a slow rollout. And Satan is not just sitting back and allowing it to happen without any opposition. Satan has already done his dead level best to thwart God at every opportunity. He tried to do it with Joseph. He tried to do it with Jacob. He tried to do it with Jacob's sons. He's tried to do it with the Israelites in Egyptian captivity. He tried to do it through Moses. In Moses, trying to get Moses to uh, completely reject God's offer of leadership. Satan has been busy. Even though Moses has not explicitly said it, you can see it going on. And in some occasions, when you get later on into the history of Israel, you're going to see Satan doing much more explicit work against God's people. He has been thwart or trying to thwart God's plan all along. And he doesn't give up. He doesn't stop. And so all of that is in the background as we read this and as we witness what's about to take place. And by the way, I've referred to Randall Bailey's commentary quite often, and I highly recommend it. And I won't read all of what he re uh, writes about the holiness of God, but he compares the holiness or the boundaries, the boundaries that Moses is to set around Mount Sinai with the boundaries of the tabernacle that will be built. There was a summit at Sinai. Only Moses was to go to the summit. In the tabernacle, the most holy place. Only the high priest is to go in the most holy place. At Sinai, there's a midpoint 
in that mountain where only the priest and the elders could go. In the tabernacle, the holy place is where only the priest could go. And at the base of Mount Sinai, the people were gathered. And in the tabernacle, the courtyard, the people were gathered. You can see the parallels. There's boundaries being set forth. This uh, basic uh, division is already being put forth here. Verse 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now that is an understatement that Moses makes here. <laughs> all the people that were in the camp trembled. Randall Bailey puts it this way, they were scared out of their wits. Wouldn't you be? Have you ever been around a volcano? I've never been around one. I've seen footage of it on uh, uh, TV, newsreels and uh, uh, news reports. Uh, do you remember Mount St. Helens out in Washington when it interrupted? Big, big thing. Affected so many people. Uh, unreal uh, visuals of that. Think about Mount Sinai. All of a sudden, you've got the cloud that comes upon the mountain, lightning, thunder, and then the text says a very loud trumpet sound. Now, this is not just one blast that ends. We're talking about a long, sustained trumpet blast. I mean, this thing was... And when it started, it didn't stop. Just like one of those tornado warning sirens that starts and it seems like it's going to go on forever and finally it ends. Well, this is something that is so loud and so pronounced that in combination with the thick cloud, in combination with the lightning and thunders, it's no uh, surprise that the Israelites would tremble and that they would be terrified. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. They stood at the foot of the mountain. That's where the people were to gather, just like the outer court of the tabernacle, as we've just pointed out just a minute ago. Verse 18 then says, Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. So not only do you have the thunder and lightning and thick cloud, not only do you have the trumpet blast that's already started, now on top of everything else, when the Lord descends, he's descending in fire, and it's just like the smoke from a furnace all around that mountain. The Hebrews writer talks about this in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 18, he says, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. So the Hebrews writer tells us that this thing was so terrifying, this thing was so frightening to the people that even Moses was terrified. Even he was fearful. Now that must have been a tremendous sight to behold. The Hebrews writer goes on to say in verse 22 to these brethren to whom he's writing, it's not this. He says, all of that that they saw, this is not what you've come to. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits that righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Do you get what the Hebrews writer is pointing out? He says for all of this 
uh, thundering and lightning and cloud and fire and trumpet blast for all of that spectacle, all that visual spectacle that made the people fearful, that made even Moses fearful. All of that pales into insignificance as to what you are experiencing. Now, how often do we think, boy, I wish we had God showing up just like he did to the Israelites. People would believe. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. If they rejected Jesus Christ when he came in the flesh, and they did, if they demanded that he be put to death, and they did, would they do anything different today? Human nature hasn't changed. What we need to get fixed in our minds is that the reality of what we have waiting for us in heaven is far greater than what the Israelites experienced. Now get that fixed in your mind as you read these words. We we'll come back to our text in verse 19. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. I'm almost convinced that this is the point at which the Hebrews writer says that Moses said, I'm fearful. At this point, I'm sure, this is when Moses got scared. And he approaches God and God talks to him. So that uh, trumpet blast has been sustained and now the, the uh, decibel le level gets even louder. It gets even louder, if you can imagine that. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. So Moses only is allowed to go to the, to the summit of Sinai. He goes up to the top. And verse 21 says, when the, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Human nature, right? We want to see. We want to go and see what's going on. Like curiosity you know, kills the cat, we say. They want to see it. And God says, you warn the people, don't break through those boundaries. If they break through those boundaries, then they will perish. That's unbelievable, isn't it? That the holiness of God, the holiness of the Lord, is that potent. Verse 22, Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Now think about this for a minute. The holiness of the Lord is a force that is uncontrollable in the world. No one can control the holiness of the Lord. The holiness of the Lord in its full force is something that you cannot defend against. Does that give a little bit more insight as to the fear of of the Lord that went before the Israelites. The enemies of God could not stand against the Israelites as they were going through Canaan because it says the terror of the Lord, the fear of the Lord was before them. I believe that's the holiness of the Lord that is used as a weapon by God against the enemies. The holiness of God in its full magnitude is such that human beings cannot stand against it. There's no army on this earth, no military force known to man that could stand against the full holiness of Jehovah. Now does that give you an idea of the magnitude of the God that we serve? We say sometimes, and we're right, that God is omnipotent as well as omniscient and omnipresent. And I think that's absolutely correct. But I'm, I'm fearful that we say it so often that we lose the punch of that. God is omnipotent. He's all 
powerful. There's not a nuclear missile that can destroy God. There's not a weapon devised by man that can, that can stand against him in his full holiness. And this is a small demonstration of it, by the way. So we continue. Verse 24. Verse 23. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. That implies, because he's speaking of the Lord in the third person, that this is possibly the second person of the Godhead speaking. He will, not I will, he will. Uh, it's quite possible, or it could be the angel of the Lord, as we've discussed before. Verse 25, so Moses went down to the people and told them. So the stage is now set, as it were, for one of the most significant events in the entirety of human history. Not the most significant. The most significant event was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the tomb. But this is one of the most significant events that we're about to see take place. Moses obeyed the Lord. He went down to the repeat the warning. No unauthorized people touched the forbidden mountain. No one was destroyed. That sets the stage now for what we're about to see take place in chapter 20. We call what we're about to read the Ten Commandments. And it's based on English translations of the Hebrew text. When you carefully study what those that know the Hebrew language will tell you, uh, correctly so, it's not ten commandments as such that the Hebrew text says, it's ten words, the ten words. In fact, it's called the Decalogue uh, by many, uh, based in part on what the Hebrew text tells us, the ten words. Uh, Bailey goes into a long discussion, interesting discussion, on how the Ten Commandments, as we call them, should be divided. Uh, there's been those that would say it's not really ten, it's twelve. And uh, it's interesting the way that you divide one of the verses, as we will see. But when you look at what I believe it's Leviticus says in repeating the Ten Commandments, with what is said here, we can see that it's actually ten. Ten words, ten commandments, if you want to call it that. How should they be divided? To me, it seems that the Lord's division in Matthew chapter 22 is about the best way to look at it. In Matthew 22, you remember he is asked what's the first and great commandment. He says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, he says, is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he says this, upon these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. And that's an interesting statement that the Lord makes there in Matthew 22. On these two commands, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. What he's saying is simply this. You take a nail, you drive it here. Take a nail, drive it here, and you've got the Ten Commandments. What does that tell us? That tells us that the first four commandments of the Ten are about God, man's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second six commandments are man's relationship to his fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. There have been some who have speculated, and I think they could be correct, that at the top of the tables of stone, which are going to be given by Mo to Moses by God, that on the very top of those tables of stone are on one table, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and on the top of the other table of stone, love your neighbor as yourself. I think there's something to be said for that because of what Jesus says in Matthew 22. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. However those tablets of stone looked or however they were divided, 
they were divinely given by God to Moses to the Israelites. And these Ten Commandments not only serve as the fundamental foundation of Israelite religion, it serves also as the fundamental foundation for jurisprudence from then until now. If a nation, a society, an empire were to take the principles that are articulated in the ten words, the Decalogue, and put them into practice, that nation will be prosperous, will be peaceful, and will be successful. But the fact is, not all nations follow the Ten Commandments. We, on our dollar bill, and on our money have a statement, in God we trust. That's a good statement. That's a good uh, credo, if you want to put it that way, for a nation to live by. But is our nation living up to that motto, in God we trust? From top to bottom? In all aspects of life? That's a question that is a serious one that's got to be addressed. Uh, not only in politics, but especially in religion. When you have a major denomination that is dividing over the issue of gay marriage, and the conservatives in that denomination are being left holding the bag, as it were, they're told, well, you'll get so much money to form your own denomination, but you won't have the buildings, you won't have the infrastructure, you know, we'll see you later. That tells you something, doesn't it? It tells you something that when uh, someone has been married two, three, four, five, six times, that it's looked at, eh, no big deal. No big deal. When people lie, cheat and steal in business and other aspects of life, well, that's, you know, he's wanting to be successful. All of these things are excused. And all of these things are addressed directly by God to Israel right here in Exodus 20. And all of these things, save one, are repeated in the New Testament. There's only one of these uh, commands or words that's not repeated in the New Testament as a requirement for Christians today. The Lord himself, Jesus, talks about the ten words, the Decalogue. It's that important. If we were to live morally by these principles, we'd have a lot better society. But the fact is, we're not living by these principles. That is, we, I'm talking about in general, in society. And I fear is increasingly too common that in the Lord's church, people are not living by these principles. And that is part of the reason why we see so many problems and difficulties. But having said all of that, we get into the text. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the Lord your God. The natural phenomena that we've already seen that has accompanied God's voice at the mountain has so terrified the people of Israel that they pleaded for Moses to act as their intermediary in delivering the Lord's will. These 10 words were both spoken and later on, as we're going to see in chapter 31, were written by God. And I always think about the movie, The Ten Commandments. I can't help but think about it. Charlton Heston playing Moses up there on the mountain. And all of a sudden you see Moses, Moses, that big, deep voice. And all of a sudden you see the fire come out and hits those tables of stone and writes on those tables. That's one of the most visually uh, moving depictions of God's work there as being described here in writing these words on these two tables of stone. So he begins in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. God delivered Israel from Egypt the house of bondage. And so the Lord makes his claim. He lays his claim upon Israel. That claim that God makes 
forms the basis of the people's gratitude and obligation to God and comes first in this covenant statement. The particular kind of ancient covenant that we need to think about uh, to understand the covenant made here at Sinai is a covenant that is called the suzerainty covenant. The suzerainty covenant is an agreement that is made by a conqueror with his subjects. In such a covenant, the conqueror, in this case God, God is the one that delivered the Israelites out of Egypt and conquered Egypt. The conqueror sets forth both his actions on behalf of the people and then his requirements for his people. So even here we see that what's being done is in line with what's already taken place in other covenants in the past. God is simply following that model. God is the ultimate conqueror and he's setting forth his requirements of his people in the suzerainty covenant. You shall have no other gods before me. This first commandment, this first word, excludes polytheism, worship of many gods. Together with the second commandment that we will see shortly, it demands the worship of the Lord alone and prohibits all idolatry. This principle, worshiping God, is the basis for many laws of worship that we will see as described further. Making people ritually fit, instructions for the priesthood, plans for the facilities of worship, laws of sacrifice, and many other things that we're going to see. This serves as the foundation of it. But why does he say you shall have no other gods before me? No other gods? Does that mean that there are gods besides Jehovah? No, not at all. It emphasizes this statement that Israel owed its primary loyalty to God and distinguished Israel from all other people of antiquity. Israel existed, remember, in a pagan world, in a polytheistic world, with proliferated images of gods and goddesses. The covenant's first commandment begins not with a theological argument that Yahweh is the only true God. He is the only one to which Israel owed its allegiance. That's due in the first place the difficulty of wording a command of monotheism without referring to other deities. And the second place, because this relationship established by the covenant would through practice Teach Israel that there is indeed only one true God. All of these generations that have gone before, including this one, have only been exposed to Egyptian polytheism. All of the statues, all of the buildings, the pyramids, the sphinx, that Pharaoh himself is the manifestation of Ra, the god of the Nile, the sun god as well. And now God has shattered that. He's destroyed it. And he is now establishing the people, I am the only true God above all others. And think about it. That principle, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, we know that we don't worship other gods today, do we? <laughs> you think we worship other gods? You better believe we do. What do we worship? The God of money, the God of entertainment, the God of sex, you name it. There are gods proliferated in the United States. We just don't have the statues erected to them. There are gods that are worshipped today in this country above the one true God of heaven. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. You, you, you're very correct about that. Uh, you've got 
God made into man's image instead of man made into God's image. God is not directing man-made religion. I can say that beyond a shadow of a doubt because they're not following after his word. And when we stop following after his word, we're not following the God of heaven. Let me emphasize that as well. When we refuse to follow God's will, we're trying to make God into our image. We're not following the God of heaven. And we start worshiping other gods. We start worshiping other goddesses. Uh, later on, <clears throat> the prophet would be talking, would talk about in the book of Ezekiel, I believe, the idols in the heart. You can erect idols in your heart. You can worship an idol God within yourself and not have to bow down to a statue. And that's the principle that God is setting forth. You shall have no other gods besides me, literally, before me. In other words, Israel eventually wanted to have it both ways. In fact, during the time that Israel was being conquered by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians, what they find in these houses is in the houses of Israelites, small statues to Baal and other gods, Ashtoreth and others. They're worshiping these idols in secret as well as going to the temple for the worship of God. And isn't that what God describes to Ezekiel when he shows through that vision what the people are doing in the temple? where they're actually openly worshiping the Son, God sets forth the principle that that is absolutely out of bounds. It's absolutely wrong here in this verse. And then he elaborates on this in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol. The King James says a graven image. Or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You will not make a likeness to them, a graven image, an image that is fashioned after man's hands. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. That's interesting. This statement of God to Moses, to the people, forbids the creation of images for the purpose of worship whether it be to pagan gods or whether it be to the God of heaven. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, if you notice, uh, you use the word jealous, the word jealous, a lot of times we think that's negative, but that's very good. Uh, jealous, the word jealous, you know, 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 you uh, this uh, form occurs in several other places throughout uh, uh, Genesis or Exodus through Deuteronomy. And sometimes it carries with it the idea of envy or uh, jealousy as a marital term, which is really the idea that's set forth here. Uh, as a husband or as a wife, you are jealous of other threats to your, of threats to your uh, marriage. Uh, other men and other women, you're jealous of that. In fact, you don't want it. You have no desire for it. God had no desire for this as any part of the Israelites. If you look at it from that aspect, it really makes a lot of sense. In the polytheism of the day, the gods were perceived as forces in the world, and the image represented that force. The image was thought to house the god. So at times, they would fuse the two entities uh, and you can see that uh, discussed in ancient Near Eastern texts, in fact, where it talks about washing the mouth of the image, washing the mouth of the idol, which visualizes sanctified the image for the deity. And in fact, this is something that's not just common to the ancient Near East. As late as the year 2000, in Birmingham, Alabama, there was a Hindu temple that was erected 
there in town. Birmingham News had a big article about it. And the big picture they had with that article was of the caretaker of the Hindu temple feeding the icons, as they called it. The big pantheon of icons was set up here against the wall, and he had a plate of food was feeding the icons. And he cared for those icons, those idols, every day. That gives you the idea of what the pagan world did in these days. They would carefully wash these gods and goddesses, carefully make sure they were clean, the mouth especially, because that's where the idol would speak. And oftentimes, that idol would be hollowed out where someone could get inside it and speak in normal voice, and that voice would be amplified, and to those that didn't know, they would think that the idol was actually speaking. That's how they were able to pull a fast one over on people, to say that these gods are real, instead of just statues. Well, here we see that God forbids anything like this taking place. You're not to erect anything like this. You shall not worship them or serve them. He, re he says that, he, he emphasizes that to them. His jealousy as well as his loving kindness. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God, Paul would say. Toward them that fail severity, but toward the goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. Very good representation of what Paul talks about there in the book of Romans. The goodness and the severity of God. His goodness is shown in what he's doing for the Israelites. His severity is shown toward those who turn their back on him. And that principle is going to be emphasized over and over and over again by God to his people. All right, so this is where we will stop today and we will resume our study of this very important text uh, 